In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Dr. Samuel Buckner of the University of South Florida, who's an assistant professor of exercise science. We talk about volume. How much volume does Instagram blow up the volume debate? What actually does the evidence say about volume? And we, of course, talk about his work in blood flow restriction, spitballing some ideas for clinical studies, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. As you just heard, my voice just crackled. That's okay, I'm human. Um, I'm here today with Dr. Samuel Buckner of the University of South Florida. And I am extremely excited to talk to him because I know he has thoughts about the, the latest and greatest fitness trends. He's doing research in that area. He recently published a paper called uh, The Dose-Response Relationship Between Resistance Training Volume and Muscle Hypertrophy. There are still doubts. It's a very interesting title. I'm looking forward to the episode. Welcome to the podcast and the video cast for those watching on YouTube. Right on. Thanks for having me. So just briefly, for those that are not familiar with your work, who are you? Why did you get interested in exercise science and more particularly strength training? Yeah, so um, I grew up doing gymnastics and uh, I can recall back in, in high school, all I liked to do was work out, lift weights, go train. And um, when it came time to pick a degree, you know, when you're filling out the college applications, I picked athletic training because I was like, oh, I want to train athletes. That sounds cool. Um, and then I got to college and I you know, I was a semester into my athletic training degree and I realized it was wrapping ankles, treating injuries and, and not training athletes like I thought it was. Um, somewhere along the way, I discovered like kinesiology, exercise physiology um, and, and got a little bit into strength and conditioning. Um, I ended up becoming a, a strength coach or as an intern strength coach for a year at Florida Atlantic University. Um, and I I enjoy being a coach, but I also realized that that environment really wasn't for me. Um, and the director of the program at Florida Atlantic walked into the gym one day and said, hey, you should come get a master's degree. So I kind of fell into a master's degree somewhat reluctantly, um, got a master's in exercise physiology where for a large portion of that, I ran a body composition lab. So I did a lot of underwater weighing, a lot of bod pods and those sorts of things. I still had no interest in research, like, like not even a little bit. I, I didn't think it was fun. It didn't seem cool. Um, and I ended up being persuaded to go to an academic conference. And I remember sitting in the conference and I was watching a presentation on like creatine, protein. It was sponsored by GNC. And I, I thought to myself, I think I can do what these guys are doing. Um, and, and that started, I guess, my journey to getting a PhD, um, which it took me to many different places. Actually, I finally settled at university of Mississippi, um, working with Jeremy Lenneke, who I, I know you're familiar with. Um, why, was, why did you settle on Ole Miss? Um, <clears throat> well, I had a previous experience. So I, I started my PhD at university of Nebraska. Um, it, we were doing kind of supplement research, um, some muscle growth stuff as well, but me and my mentor were just weren't a good fit. Um, we had different, I had, I guess my style of learning and his style of mentorship, it, it didn't, it didn't go well together at all. Um, and I quit at the end of my first year, of my PhD. And, and I thought I was done. Honestly, I, I went back to, to Florida. I was a adjunct instructor at Florida Atlantic university. So I was teaching courses. I was working as a trainer. Um, and Mike Zordos was at FAU at the time. He's still at FAU. Um, and he was friends with Jeremy Lenneke who had just finished his PhD. And he said, hey, why don't you come to the conference, meet Jeremy, um, and, and maybe it'd be a good fit for a PhD for you. Um, so we, we met, we hung out a little bit, we got to know each other. Um, because at that point I had learned, it's very important to, to have a good relationship with your mentor because you have to be able to question them. You have to be able to, um, you know, education at that level is, is, is like, 
push and pull, you know, and uh, we had, we worked well together because, you know, he would push me a lot. He would shoot down my ideas, but he'd also be open to me shooting ideas his way. And sometimes I'd be right. Sometimes I was wrong, but that process is so good for learning. You know, when you have a bad idea, you learn a lot from that bad idea. And um, yeah, for me, it was just the mentor fit. It, it was the right one at the right time. And, uh, you know, he was studying blood flow restriction. I th he was known for that, in fact, which I had no interest in. Like I had heard about blood flow restriction probably a few years prior during my master's degree. And it seemed so counterintuitive to me. And, and I remember thinking to myself, well, who's going to put these bands on their arms or legs and actually train? Um, so to me, it was funny that I ended up doing a lot of research on blood flow restriction during my PhD um, and, you know, learned a lot about the technique. Um, I still do blood flow restriction research, of course. Um, but to me, it was always funny because I thought it was the silliest thing when I first read about it. And then I ended up, you know, doing a, a, a large amount of research on, on BFR. Um, so yeah, it was uh, ultimately, I wanted to study skeletal muscle growth and adaptation. Um, how much can muscles grow? What makes muscles grow? Um, looking at different variations um, or, or training manipulations and how they impact growth of a muscle. Um, and BFR allowed me to do that because BFR is a technique that grows muscle. Um, so ultimately it was a means to an end for me to refine my skills of imaging, ultrasounding muscle, measuring growth. Um, and he was an amazing mentor, you know, his, his ability to challenge and, and, and to, um, push you to, to be a better scientist and be a better thinker, um, which was so valuable to me and, and still is. So before we kind of move on into more of your recent work, um, your past work on blood flow restriction, obviously this being the, the BFR better for results podcast can include blood flow restriction cannot. But of course, you're you're well published in the space. What are some of the the main takeaways from a muscle physiology perspective that you've you know walked away from with specifically the use of blood flow restriction? And what are important questions that you feel still exist? I mean, still, this is a brand new area, <laughs> science wise, but questions that you are personally interested in based on your interest in muscle physiology? Yeah. So a lot of the work we did um, you know, during my PhD and, and, and sometime after was on methodological approaches to BFR. So what cuffs to use, what pressures to use? Um, do you need to use high pressure? Should you be using a lower pressure? Um, how does pressure compare between different devices? Um, so I feel like a lot of the work we did, um, you know, there's still no standardization, um, but, but I think people can pick up a device and maybe apply the pressure in a more informed way um, than they could say four or five years ago. Um, so I think a lot of the work we did was, was beneficial in, in, in helping people to apply a more homogenous stimulus across their participants as opposed to an absolute pressure. From a um, research perspective, you're saying? From a research perspective. And, and then, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully they can take that and, and you know, individuals like yourself, I, I, I hope that research is helpful in, in understanding, you know, if, if I use a high pressure with this device or a low pressure, you know, what differences can I expect? Um, I know, you know, his lab has, has focused a lot on the perceptual um, responses as of late. Um, so they're, they're still working on um, understanding and, and maybe finding easier ways to implement the technique. I think a lot of people are scared by the technique because it, it seems too complex. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, you need to apply a mild pressure, really, um, to, to get the initial stimulus. And, um, you know, I'm probably currently more interested from just a gym perspective. You know, I, I, I my work is less clinical, uh, or it has tended to be less clinical over the past five or six years. Um, and the latest study that we did was looking at... <laughs> I think this idea was interesting. It didn't quite work out, but we are interested in teasing out um, the metabolic versus mechanical portion. Um, and what we did is we tried to decrease the, not the mechanical aspect, but the total time under tension with a high load. So we basically had people do 
um, four sets of three repetitions, which is not going to make you grow. It's not enough volume. You're not close enough to failure. So we put cuffs on the individuals, inflated the cuffs for three minutes. And we tried to make those three reps, even though they're the first three reps of the set, we tried to make those reps like the last three reps. Um, so like you're doing three reps, but we want that to be like the last three reps of your set. Um, practically, that doesn't do much for anybody. Uh, but physiologically, to me, it was interesting because in, in my mind, there was no application where you need BFR with a high load. But I was, I was interested in, could, could you pre-fatigue the muscle and with very low volume, get the same growth as a higher volume protocol? Um, so I think my current um, endeavors of BFR are, are a little out there. Uh, and they're more physiological in nature, less practical in understanding the, like if there's this meter of making the muscle grow where we have to fatigue the muscle with a certain amount of volume, how can BFR change the amount of volume we need to do with different training loads. Does that make sense? No, it makes, it makes perfect sense. I mean, for me, <clears throat> the ultimately how I like to think of how muscles grow is really relating it to the muscle fiber level in terms of the force velocity curve and how effort will be somewhat of a surrogate for muscle activation. And you, as you mentioned before, like, especially at low loads, we need to fatigue the muscle in order to get the muscle contraction velocity slow enough so we get the adequate actin and myosin overlap to thus produce mechanical tension, which, um, again, curious your thoughts, but for me, I think that that can help, that model helps explain a lot, maybe not all, but a lot of the stimulus that the muscles use to be able to grow. I think Greg Nich Knuckles on a podcast was relating kind of the arguments about muscle hypertrophy to more of like a philosophical debate where it, it could be um, sufficient, but not necessarily like absolutely necessary to grow muscle. I think it's a sufficient stimulus. I think that's an interesting way to think about it. So with the application of BFR and heavy loads, taking that lens, for me, it's almost a barometer of how, how somebody understands how muscles grow in the first place when they say, oh, like BFR and heavy loads, will that give me a better benefit? But my question to you is someone that's studying, studying this and particularly have used it in some sort of combination with heavy loads is why would we want to use a stimulus where we have the gold standard for muscle, muscle mass and muscle strength, which is heavy loads, why would we want to reduce the juice or basically reduce the, the, the volume that we can accomplish at with a gold standard type approach by using something like BFR, which is just going to make something more uncomfortable? Like, is there a potential in any world, do you see the addition of BFR either during the rest periods, during the set to be any sort of therapeutic or enable additional growth. So in co specifically in combination with high loads in combination with high loads. Yes. Okay. Talking about, and let's, let's qualify this at 70 plus percent of the one rep max. Yeah. Currently I, I don't think there's any utility there. Um, and, and you know, that's what we tried to do. We tried we took 70% of one RM Mm -hmm. And then we made it suboptimal. So we made it so it wouldn't grow your muscle. And then we tried to make up for that by applying pressure. Mm -hmm. it didn't work. Um, and we, you know, we've had talks in the lab. Some of my students are like, I think we can refine it. I think we can make the protocol better um, with, with a few tweaks, whether it's more pressure or apply the cuff for a longer period of time before we begin contraction. Um, and, and they might be right. We might be able to get that to work. Um, but I'm just not interested enough right now to, to run the study. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, Matt Jesse in, in his dissertation, I think explained um, some of this pretty well when he discussed, you know, muscle contraction disturbs blood flow. And when you go light enough with the external load, there's not enough mechanical compression to compress the vasculature. So essentially it's very hard to fatigue with 70% of one RM. The, the mechanical compression of the vascular is such that you're going to fatigue within eight to 12 reps. Well, if you had BFR, what are you going to do? I think you're still going to fatigue 
um, in, in a somewhat, I don't know how much of a repetition reduction it would be, but it may not even be a whole lot. And the reason I don't think it may not be a whole lot is because when you contract your muscle, right, that's going to push blood back out. And with such a high force contraction, you're almost counteracting the BFR, I think. And, and I'm, I'm thinking on the spot here. Um, but it, good. That's what I want you to do. That's why we have these discussions. Cause I got, but, I got more in the, in the tank because I have thoughts you mentioned before, before we pivot back to this about mild pressure. And that's, I think something in the industry that I think we've now started to gravitate more toward mild pressure than higher pressures. But what I was referring to with regards to the heavy loads would be like, we do have we do have acute studies that look at repetitions to fatigue with with the addition of BFR either during the exercise itself or during the rest period. And we tend to see in my thinking on the spot here um, about a one to two repetition reduction in reps to fatigue. So there is some fatiguing stimulus that's happening with the restriction of blood flow and partially I personally think with such low repetitions, it's likely due to discomfort um, and, you know, just not wanting to deal with the, the pressure that you're exerting, the backward flow, which I, again, agree with um, on your body. And I will say I am a, I have a personal experience with heavy lifting with BFR because I've done almost all of the, the, the protocols that exist because I want to know how practical it is perceptually does it i have a you, you probably can't see it but i have a collapsed valve on my um left forearm because i was doing a six week series of bfr with bicep curls okay. and for me as a physical therapist and educator of trying to get the what i would consider the safest but hopefully most optimal application of bfr I, I just don't see a theoretical rationale and I have the battle scars to, <laughs> to, to show that there's a potential influence on the vascular system um, to, to the application of BFR with heavy lifting. Um, but I did like the paper um, uh, that you, that you did. And I understood what you were trying to, what you're trying to do. Um, it's just interesting because you see people then pick it up and they're like, oh, well, if BFR is good with a low load, then certainly it must be just as good with a higher load. And that's where I think the disconnect in thought processes kind of happen yeah. um, with, with that. Is there anything in the space that you, you know, projects that are, are either ongoing or your, you know, certain areas of BFR that you're looking to explore a little bit more. I know you mentioned you're not that interested in heavy lifting, pairing it with BFR. Is there any other sort of area? You don't have to talk about your projects that you currently are doing for whatever reason. I personally always love talking about my projects, even if they're not published, but I don't know if that's an academia thing or, you know, or just me trying to just be as transparent as possible. Cause some people like sharing their work that they're doing. Some people don't, I don't know. Um, it, but it, yeah, usually it depends on the study um, and maybe how controversial the study is going to be. Um, and then the hopes of getting a, a fair and, and blinded review process. I, th these things are getting more and more blurred, especially with preprints. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I right now we have a huge training study going on, which is taking the, the bulk of our attention. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, we're doing a, like a muscle size and strength cross-sectional study. Um, but we talked previously um, off camera about maybe doing some, some comparison of different devices because we've recently acquired some of the different BFR devices and I want to implement them in research because they're much easier to use. You know, we use the Hokanson machine and that is such a pain. Mm -hmm. um, you got to stay close to the cart. The hose always pops out. Um, so it's been probably one of the most researched devices and utilized devices. And um, I'm starting to distance myself from it. So we, we want to compare as many devices as we can get our hands on um, to see how different pressures apply or how high and low pressures look between these devices as far as repetitions performed, um, perceptual cues, all these sorts of things. I think that'd be a great study. Um, 
and you know I, I think i think we're about a year away from that just just because this training study is such a huge undertaking for us no i i listen again not talking about the training study i'm familiar with what you're doing i think that's going to be insane to review that data um for what you're doing and yeah like for me i i am very much uh, a willing and able to help with some of the different devices. Cause I think that without, again, spinning too much into the BFR world, cause there's one more area that I do want to talk about and hear your thoughts on, but that as more and more of these devices are getting into the marketplace and we don't necessarily, we basically underappreciate that the way that a device is constructed can impact the acute physiological stimulus that it's giving to the person. And for me, as somebody who's taught with a, almost all of the devices that are commercially available, the major commercially available devices, they all feel somewhat different, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, and, and whether or not that's the presence of auto regulation, so the pressure adjusts according to the phase of contraction, whether it's the bladder type, so all the different ways in which, you know, it acts as a tourniquet or it doesn't, and the shape, the width, you know, your lab, um, you know, Jeremy's lab previously, I think that might've been before your time, um, talking about the, the, I mean, you did, a. I think you might've been on some of the, the, the papers that were looking at, you know, preference on, uh, like cuff width on oh, the legs oh, and the oh, upper oh, body. Oh, and oh. I tend to agree with everything that's been said there. Um, so there are different feels and if BFR, as you mentioned, is something that works. I think we can firmly say that it works. How it works, up for debate, although I try, I tend to relate everything to regular strength training and fit it in so it's not as mystical. But then all of a sudden you have all these cuffs coming out. And so if you're a clinician and a lot of my audience is are physical therapists um, or certainly well-educated personal trainers, and you're using this with people, you wanna know, hey, how can I how can I ensure an adequate stimulus minus taking something to volitional fatigue, right? We know that that's probably going to work, but how comfortable it is, the efficacy. These are all questions that as more and more devices are coming on, we need answers. And that's why, you know, hooking up with researchers such as yourself to be able to help answer some of these questions are so important, not from a, a research perspective. Yeah, that's great. But also like a practical implementation. Yeah. So it's uh it's it's going to be interesting to see kind of where this goes because my own research has kind of showed that depending on the device that you use it does impact the physiological stimulus and that unfortunately is being oversought in a lot of these research papers cuz BFR is hot as you know right so like yeah. oh i'm going to get funded i'm going to do a BFR paper but then they're misapplying the limb algorithms so they're actually it it goes crazy and crazy and crazy. You'll so you see a, a modern paper use a pressure based on the study from 2011 that used arm circumference in a different cuff that was a different size and a different material. Um, so that, that that I still see that a lot. I'm glad that it frustrates you to the same degree as me because it's like it it, it it's so frustrating, and that's kind of where. I want to pivot into the last little bit on BFR before we go into your more recent paper where it's the pressure, the role of pressure. Now, I want you I want you to agree or disagree and provide rationales for the following statement, okay? And again, this is all completely off the cuff here, no pun intended. Um, the pressure that's applied during BFR exercise is mostly relevant for the resting period or the period between muscle contractions than it is for during the muscle contraction itself. I think I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's this or that. I would say it's probably more important during the rest for me than the contraction, simply because the the you're shooting blood back through during the contraction so you're overcoming that pressure during the contraction during the rest you're you're pooling the blood 
Um, so I think that's why you start. That's your sec your first set of BFRs, typically your easiest. Your second set, you pull that blood metabolites, it was stuck below the cuff. So I, I kind of look at look at it, and I'm supposed to answer yes or no. Um, your second set, I believe you start in a more fatigue state than your first set. Um, and, and that kind of carries across, if you're doing four sets, it carries across your four sets of exercise. Um, whereas if you did that free flow, you would have had these bouts of recovery in between. Um, and I think that's why with, with lower loads, you're able to accomplish the fatigue necessary to grow the muscle with a lower volume. Um, and, and I think that'd be the quick summary of, of BFR from me. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? No, I, I tend to wholly agree. So this is where my head goes as a clinician and as a researcher second. We have already we already know that if you use a BFR cuff that's capable of restriction, right? And by restriction, I mean arterial restriction um, and using a single chamber bladder system that the higher the pressure, the more uncomfortable it gets, the greater the physiologic response and and everything in between. And the adherence in terms of my own experience tends to dr drop off when we get you know, 80% of the limb occlusion or arterial occlusion pressure. And so where my head goes is, is that if you look at some of the research that looks at does intramuscular occlusion of the small micro capillaries within the muscle, where does that happen in the relative percent of one rep max? And in my research, it happens as early as 20% and as high as 40 to 45% of the one rep max. So with that being said, you know you have intramuscular occlusion that's happening during a contraction. Mm -hmm. So then it goes back to, okay, well, with light loads, we can we know that with or without BFR and light loads, I'm quantifying as, you know, I would say on the low, low end, kind of the work that, you know, Jeremy, and I think you might've been on the 15% of the one rep max, like that would be on the very, very, very low end. But typically what I think about is 20 to 30%. Yeah. We can still get a fatiguing stimulus, but when we start to get super light, the, the, there's no intramuscular occlusion occurring even without B, you know, with BFR, because it's just, it's just such a light weight. Like you can do it pretty much indefinitely. So I think I tend to think that the pressure is a vehicle to just keep those metabolites and the and some blood, right? But we know that there is going to be blood that's going to push past the cuff. I mean, I, I they showed that or even at a hundred percent in in one of the studies, leg extension, Singer, 2018, 2019, or whatever. So that was like you're getting you're still getting some venous flow there. So then my mind just goes back to, well, we just want to trap the metabolites and have them exert their fatiguing effects. And I 100% agree with you that we don't need very high pressures to do so in the vast, vast, vast majority of, of circumstances. So therefore, it's interesting where, okay, if, if, we, if we both mutually agree that it's for the rest period, then my next question is, well... What about resting BFR, where you're now using a load that's 20 to 30%, and you have a cuff that's capable of quick inflation, and so you're trapping those metabolites, but now you're reducing the intra-exercise physiologic stimulus, but you're still able to fatigue the muscles because you're trapping those metabolites. And I think that that to me, that there was one study that was published um, in Frontiers in Physiology that was looking at that. But I, have, I haven't seen, there's another one, Suga, or one, one of the Japanese researchers um, has showed that there, you know, there is some effect of an intermittent or resting uh, on, uh, on certainly metabolite accumulation. But that's where my head goes, because what if we can make BFR more tolerable but right now, the limitation is we need accessible technology that we can quickly inflate mm -hmm. and quickly deflate. And I think that that's the barrier right now for long, for widespread adoption of some uh, of this type of technology. Because if we use a load that's relatively heavy enough, we trap the metabolites, boom, we're getting the effects of BFR without a lot of the associated discomfort. 
And so for me as a clinician, that's where my head goes with all the pressure. And then if we don't need a lot of pressure, then okay, well, when do, when do we apply the pressure? Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of where, where my head goes. And that's where I'm really excited. I'm, we talked offline about this. Like I'm, I'm really not super interested in the clinical applications of BFR, believe it or not, because I think we know that it works. So if you have somebody where your goal is, I need to improve muscle mass, I need to improve muscle strength, or I need to improve some function, typically in physical therapy, it's all three, and they're load compromised, right? BFR is going to, to work. I'm more interested in how can we make it work just as effectively, but now reduce some of the barriers to long-term adherence. Yeah. So I, maybe I gave you some ideas, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I'll make two comments. First one, uh, back to when you were talking about the, the lowest external load. Um, that was mine and Matt Jesse's dissertation. So 15% caused growth in the lower body, regardless of the application of BFR when training the failure. The problem was you have to do like 90 reps per set. In the upper body, the load was insufficient for muscle growth and adding BFR couldn't make up for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of the inverse of the study we we're talking about earlier. Can, can BFR make up for too low volume with high load training? It can't. And then it also couldn't make up for too light of a weight where you could do the reps indefinitely. Um, at least that's what my dissertation showed in the bicep curl. So it worked 15% was sufficient in the lower body. It was insufficient in the upper body. Um, but I like that idea you had. And um, maybe we can talk, talk offline because I, I think the Hokanson might be Yep. designed to, to actually implement a study like that, at least mm -hmm. maybe an initial study comparing the perceptual experience during exercise of inflating just during the rest versus the entire time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we could, we could talk about that more um, after the podcast. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, that's, it just gets the juices going when you kind of obviously have passion about an area and yeah. and you're thinking about it a lot because that's what I just think about it a lot and how we can help more people but reduce the barrier. I think you mentioned before too the device characteristics and features, understanding how we can apply research to practice and and really look at these devices and say do they do what they're supposed to do? Because right now, you know, there's devices that are saying, oh, we get all the benefits of BFR, but now we're safer, but we're not giving the exact same stimulus. Mm -hmm. And so it's just trying to separate some of the marketing from the science. So I appreciate your your perspectives and your work, maybe upcoming work in, in this as well. Um, any last comments on BFR before we pivot to the, the juice, the meat and potatoes, the uh, steak? Let's get to the steak. All right. Well, so let's let's contextualize this. Um, I think in social media right now, um, there is this huge um, thought, not not pervasive, but it's it's a very pervasive thought. Let's just put it that way. That we need a lot more volume to grow as we become more and more trained, and we need a certain amount of volume, meaning sets times reps or however you want to quantify um, volume, more is better um, typically. And so your recent paper that again talked about the, it was entitled the dose response relationship, uh, relationship between resistance training volume and muscle hypertrophy, there are still doubts, kind of touches upon where we may be at in the current body of literature. So in an effort to try to translate some of the research to practice, Let's hear some of your thoughts about, do we need a lot of volume? Do we need maybe less than is, than is currently recommended? What has your investigation into this area of strength training resulted in? Yeah, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll, I'll tell a story when I first became skeptical of this because I, I think it shows where my thinking began. Um, <laughs> for, for me, it was during my PhD. Um, and, and during my PhD, the, the dose response relationship um, for volume paper from the Schoenfeld lab had just come out. And I was new to research. I was doing, you know, uh, research in the biceps, studying muscle growth. And um, one thing that stuck out to me at the time was it was resistance trained people 
and they did no direct biceps training. You know, they, they relied on, you know, um, the lat pull down and the seated cable roll to grow their biceps. And again, I was a new researcher and I read that paper and I remember saying to my mentor at the time, I said, their biceps grew more than our untrained people doing biceps curls for eight weeks. And I was like, can that happen? And, and to me, it just meant like, I'm not going to put a lot of stock in this data because this seems like, you know, trained people giving up. When you take a group of people um, and you recruit them, I would argue most times they're doing bicep curls in their training. And for myself, I just didn't think I could stop doing bicep curls, do lat pull down and seated cable row and grow my biceps. So at the time, all the research I had done up to that point was in the biceps. So I, I knew what bicep growth looked like. Um, you know, a few years, a few years later, I started studying the quads and doing lower body studies, measuring quadricep growth. Um, and I revisited that volume paper because it always bothered me, like trained people getting more growth than untrained people, not directly training a muscle group. And I looked at the quadriceps growth and it was 0.7 centimeters. Um, and, you know, we had just done a few studies in untrained individuals training the lower body and they were growing 0.2 centimeters. You know, untrained people are supposed mm. to grow more. So in my head, I'm like, whoa, that's, that's a tremendous amount of growth from doing high volume. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's not. I, I it, it just, it was such an impressive number to me. Um, and then I, you know, the, the final catalyst to writing this paper was in two weeks time span on social media, I saw at least a dozen posts of people saying, you need to rest longer between your exercise sets because it leads to more hypertrophy. Um, and I had, I had read this paper that they were talking about. Um, it was from the same research group and the long rest group in that paper also grew, their rectus femoris, I believe it was, grew 0.7 centimeters. Again, tremendous growth. And, and, and just to give people an idea, you know, pull out a tape measure, you know, the little ones you use for clothing and look at a centimeter. And that's, I mean, that's nearly a centimeter mm. of muscle thickness. My experience with muscle growth is that it's very slow. And in eight to 12 week time periods, you can accumulate enough to measure it. Um, but 0.7 to me is just, a, it's a huge number. Um, when people sign up for our training studies, they say, am I going to grow? I say, yeah, I, I believe you will grow from signing up for our studies. But I say, you're not going to look in the mirror and know you grew. I'll be able to tell you you grew when I look at the ultrasound data. Because over eight weeks, you typically don't grow enough to look in the mirror and go, oh, wow, check that out. Um, I believe, and I could be wrong. I believe if, if you grew 0.7 centimeters, you're going to look in the mirror and go, holy cow. Right? Because when your clothes are going to be much tighter. Because, I mean, that much muscle size across an entire muscle belly, that's a lot of growth, in my opinion. So oh. before to just cut you off, when you're measuring ultrasound, okay, contextualize for the listeners, viewers, what are you looking at and what can you actually measure during an ultrasound assessment? Yeah, so in, in all the studies I'm referencing, they measured muscle thickness utilizing B-mold ultrasound. And uh, we created a figure in the paper um, to help people visualize this. So we show um, how it's measured. So basically you hold the ultrasound probe against the muscle belly. So if I held the ultrasound probe against my bicep, I would see the muscle fat interface at the top. And I'd see the muscle bone interface at the bottom. And you basically measure straight up from the bone to the muscle fat interface, and that's muscle thickness. Um, and you know, I think these studies are possible, but when I read them, I, I, I'm i just, when I see growth that is four to five times what other studies are seeing, I put very little stock in those studies until they're replicated, right? So for, for me, we wrote this paper because everyone was telling people for hypertrophy, you need to rest for a long time. Be, why? Because if you rest longer, you're going to get more volume. And, you know, I think there's a bias and I call it the evidence-based industry. I think the evidence-based industry has a volume bias. And I think this was, you know, I was listening to a podcast 
um, by Revive Stronger. And I like I like that podcast. I enjoy that podcast. Mm -hmm. And they were reviewing that new 52 set paper. You know the 52 set paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 52 set paper had individuals do 52 sets um, towards the end of the training program, right? Um, last two up, weeks, I think. The right? last two weeks, yes. And when I was listening to the individuals discuss that paper, they said some people are saying that this isn't growth, this could be inflammation and swelling. And, and they said on more than one time, they said these people clearly have a bias um, and an agenda. And I, I thought to myself, and I even comment on the YouTube, it's like, it's, it's unfortunate that people that disagree are being written off as having an agenda and a bias. It's completely reasonable to suspect that doing 52 sets, even if you're trained, will cause swelling and inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the... the Wait, so, so, so to clarify, right? Just to be clear, I'm a, I think I know what you're saying, but you're saying that because... So people are saying, hey, they grew more and then Chris, other people are saying, hey, well, actually, it might be swelling that is the result, because I think they took the measurements on the 72 hours post. So you're just saying that we we shouldn't, um, you shouldn't dismiss somebody that might be offering a valid criticism of a methodological potential shortcoming in their design. Absolutely. Um, and I think we should... I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, but that 52 set paper, there were no statistical differences between the conditions, right? Mm -hmm. um, a trend. Were, there was a trend. Now, here's what I was, I was talking to somebody on the um, way to this podcast. And I said, if the data were the opposite, if there was a trend leaning towards lower volume, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was close. You wouldn't have all these podcasts talking about a trend in the data because it's it's for whatever reason it always it's always volumes better volumes better mm -hmm. um so and and then to dismiss any criticism against over interpret i mean maybe it's over interpreting maybe it's not but anyway there's definitely a discussion to be had right and and i, I think it's also important to think about this in that 52 set paper they were doing nine sets of leg press per training session followed by nine sets of squat and eight sets of knee extension is eight or nine per exercise, right? So if you're going to do 52 sets, at least diversify it in an exercise. And, and here's the example I use, Nick. This is the first time I'm going to try this on a podcast. I don't know if this analogy is going to really land, um, but I, this is how I explain it to my students. There's obviously a point at which doing an exercise is not going to yield additional growth, right? Because we're not designed to grow infinitely. Certainly we, there's, there's not a limitless ability to grow a muscle in a 24 hour period. So I compare it to a, a frozen pizza, right? You take a frozen pizza out of the freezer and it takes 30 minutes to cook that pizza. Right. Um, and, and this is also shows you how we are, how we treat volume and training studies. The volume equated people will say, well, you can take that pizza out and cook it for 10 minutes on Monday, put it back in the freezer, take it on Wednesday, cook it for 10 minutes, put it back in the freezer, take it on Friday and cook the pizza for 10 more minutes. At the end of that, you're not going to have a cooked pizza. You cooked it for an insufficient time every time you took it out of the freezer, right? It takes 30 minutes. So however many exercise sets, that's how many it takes to cook the pizza. Um, now you could take the pizza out and put it in for 60 minutes. What are you going to have? You have a burnt pizza. So there has to be a point and maybe that completely flopped, but that's how I teach volume to my students. There's no, no, it, may, it makes sense. No, it makes total sense. I mean, it, there's an area of diminishing potentially not harmful, but area where you, it's almost like, I, I think again, the, like the hormesis effect, it's like, you want to go, you want to go, but then doing more is not necessarily going to be better. Yeah. So in that study, I just, I can't think of a good rationale for why nine sets of any exercises is necessary <laughs> ever, right? We, we can't <laughs> infinitely increase muscle protein synthesis, right? But what, I mean, it, it was suggested that there's no swelling and inflammation because the individuals are trained. 
<clears throat> and I would like to see a citation for a study that's done that amount of volume and looked at swelling and inflammation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really reasonable explanation. And <clears throat> to write that off as, as bias and agenda is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so yeah, there, there has to be a, a, a point at which doing another exercise set is not yielding more growth. And if you want to do 52 sets, at least pick a variety of exercises because I think there's an argument for doing more exercises for a muscle group, right? You wouldn't go in and, and just do knee extensions. If you want to train your quads, you're going to do a variety of exercises. You're going to do enough sets on that exercise to fatigue and activate the motor units involved in that movement. But once you've done that, additional sets is just going to give you additional fatigue and delay recovery. And I, I absolutely think that's what happened in that study. I, I, and I think it's, it's, it's very plausible that they have swelling, that they have edema. And keep in mind, there's no statistically significant differences. Also, if you look at the NS paper with the 52 sets, if you look at their figure and how they quantified muscle CSA, and I've tried to engage with the um, evidence-based communicators on their social media to explain this, the, the CSA in, in those papers, it was pieced together on PowerPoint. So you take a snapshot and you drag the image over to PowerPoint and you piece together the CSA. When you do that, um, in, in my experience, I've, I've tried it before, you get a lot of error. And when you have a lot of error, your ability to, to detect things is, is very limited and you need a control group to know how, how much error you had in your study. So there, there's several things we could critique on this paper before we run screaming from the mountaintops. You know, there's no such thing as junk volume. Well, well if you're basing it off this one study, we need to um, we need to pump the brakes a little bit. Um, but back to the paper that we wrote, because we actually wrote this paper before the Ennis paper came out. Oh right? wow! Yeah, it, it was. We wrote it long before that paper was published, and and for me, like I said, it was inspired by. Um, people on social media telling individuals they need to rest for a long time um, to maximize muscle growth. And I think there's several lines of reasoning that suggest that's not true. Look at blood flow restriction. What does blood flow restriction do? It reduces training volume. Does it do it at the expense of muscle growth? Not to my knowledge, right? So if you reduce your rest periods during high load training, as long as you remain within a hypertrophic range, I see no reason to suspect that muscle growth is going to be compromised, right? And if we're basing it on that data from the, the, the Schoenfeld paper that looked at three minutes rest versus one minutes rest, um, again, the, the growth is just, it's in my perspective and from my experience um, measuring muscle growth, it's tremendously high. Um, another thing I found interesting, and we kind of mentioned it in the paper, um, the 0.7 centimeters of growth in the long rest condition in the rest period paper is of the same magnitude in the high volume condition in the volume paper. So it's interesting that I think it's 27 sets per week with long rest yielded the same growth as, how much was it in the uh, high volume group? 42 sets, I think in the 135 paper. Um, yeah. But even if you, if it's, it's, it's just simply interesting to me that 27 sets per week yielded 0.7. And I think it was 40 some sets per week in the other study also yielded 0.7 with 90 seconds. 45 weekly sets. Yeah, 45 weekly sets with 90 seconds rest yielded the same growth as 27 sets with three minutes rest. And mm -hmm. again, it's, it's dangerous to compare across studies, but I, I think it just highlights, okay, this data is it's showing a lot of growth. Maybe we just need to approach it with caution until we have replication. Um, and yeah, I, I think that won't work on social media though, man, that, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't, that having, having a healthy dose of skepticism rarely works on social media. It, uh, it doesn't get clicks. So you're not going to get, you're not going to get the engagement because people, just want to be they they want to just i can only relate because again i don't teach strength training i can only relate this to the bfr mm -hmm. people don't really care 
most people, right? I think my listeners and the people that are watching this will care, but the vast majority of the populations don't care about a principles-based approach. They don't care about understanding why this may happen and the explanatory mechanisms as to why you know that 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 happens. They just want a protocol. They just want to be told this is what I have to do, this amount of rest, this volume, et cetera, instead of trying to think and critically analyze. And I think that skill is very difficult to harness when you're talking about Instagram posts or even on YouTube. And although YouTube might have a little bit more of a platform, I don't follow YouTube that much, um, more Instagram. But I, it really, unfortunately, that nuance is lost on a lot of people. It is. And I've, I've learned some, or I, I've come to the conclusion recently that the evidence-based like influencers the you know, the, the, the PhDs in the social media space, um, you know, when they post in my area of research, I engage because I'm interested. I love this stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned is they don't post to have a debate or have a discussion. They post for likes and clicks. Mm -hmm. I get ignored in the, like, and, and again, this is not me complaining about being ignored in the comments, but it's, um, it's, it's, simply, <laughs> it's interesting that, you know, I, I think these people, are my peers and they want to engage in some healthy discussion because that's how science works. Mm -hmm. But every time I try to, um, you just get ignored or, or, you know, they dunk on you because they have followers and, and they can say whatever they want. Um, so yeah, the whole, the whole blending of social media and science is a really interesting thing. And I, I think, you know, the, the most popular paper, the most read paper of the year, isn't the most scientifically influential paper of the year. It's the paper that has a scientist with the most followers on it. Mm -hmm. you know, that this is, and, and I think, I think 10 or 20 years ago, um, PhDs emerged to challenge the fitness industry. I, I think this was something that happened. It was something that needed to happen, but the industry is smart the industry adapts, right? So I think what we have happening now is the industry learned, well, to compete, we need PhDs. So I think the newest iteration of the industry are individuals with PhDs, but they're still the industry. They're still here to garner whatever it is that the industry is trying to achieve, um, which I think is financial incentive. I, I don't know. And but I, I do think it's harmful to science um, when, if you do research for clicks, right? And um, this is where I was having a good discussion with James Steele because James Steele was one of the proponents for, you know, preprints. Mm -hmm. the, the purpose of a preprint was to post your paper on a server and get feedback from- Nobody people. does that. But what it's become because of the, I call it the evidence-based industry, they don't want to wait a year to make a post about a paper they just wrote. They need content today, mm -hmm. right? So the peer, the, the um, preprint process was intended to be a mechanism to, 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 to refine your work, but it's become a mechanism instead to get instant gratification on social media for things you've done. Mm -hmm. And um, is that problematic? I, I mean, I think it is when there's 20 podcasts on a paper that isn't peer reviewed and, you know, may never be published. Like so, the, uh, <clears throat> like the one that's doing the rounds now is that whole meta regression on proximity to failure and hypertrophy. I don't know if you're familiar um, with that, but that there was a, a big podcast that was done, um, that I was listening to, that was kind of using that as a vehicle to critique the effective reps model and things like that. But that hasn't been officially published. That has just been gone through the peer, uh, the preprint process. And, um, and it's being taken as, you know, gospel. Now, I will respond to you that um, as somebody who has published a preprint and as somebody who has used that information to 
make a social media post, for example. Um, my area and the way that I wanted to do that was I'm seeing the, I, I, I pre, uh, I pre-printed the beneath the cuff paper. So looking at the different cuff characteristics. And I did that because it was like, I didn't know how long it was going to be stuck in peer review purgatory. And I wanted to get that information out because I started to see researchers misapplying things like, like, like Dr. Lenicky's the algorithms that you've been using, but applying it to a cuff that doesn't occlude and all these things. Um, but I will say that in general, um, I do see a lot more preprints that are now getting taken as, oh my gosh, this is like, this is the gospel. And it hasn't really gone through peer review. Peer reviews being another topic. Hopefully you get a reviewer that actually is cares about the topic and wants to constructively criticize. But I will say too, I haven't gotten, we have, we have, I've had four or five papers that I put on preprint. One of them is a hypertrophy rep range paper that I thought was going to have a significant chatter, chatter base, nothing, echo chambers. I haven't had any sort of feedback on any of the work that I've done on a preprint. So maybe the work that I'm doing, nobody gives a shit about, which is totally fine. Um, but but that, but those are kind of my experiences with preprints and listening to what you were saying too about all of a sudden this being the 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 definitive you know version of of science and I think this opens up a huge Pandora's box because then you talk about the quality of peer review you talk about the time it takes you talk about all these other different variables that can impact when a piece of research gets actually you know visible and published in a journal yeah you know it, it takes a long time and uh you know whenever i work on a paper of my students they said well when will this get published i said <laughs> could be could be three months could be three years and, and yeah certainly it's it's frustrating it's not a perfect process but you know more than 80 percent of the time i am so thankful for it because like oh i almost sent that paper out saying this i was wrong you know, and it protects the world from my ideas <laughs> and, and vice versa. So I do think it serves a really important function when done correctly. And, you know, part of the, if, if, I think people believe there's a crisis with peer review. Part of it's probably my generation that doesn't want to do something for free. Uh, wants all the attention and glory and once, you know, peer review is, I mean, I try to review as many papers as I publish, right? Because people are doing that for me. Um, but I, I think there's more and more of this mindset that well, we need to be compensated for everything we do. And, and there are some good arguments there, but um, I, don't, I, I, I do find it interesting how it's almost like we close a book on a paper. Like if, if I got to talk about my preprints, we can talk about five papers right now that mm. are under review or I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't count them as publications yet. You know, I, mm. I, I need to get the hardest part um, of science is getting through the peer review process and, and, and getting published. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really valuable part of it. Um, but yeah, the, the emerging or the, the clashing of social media and science has become more and more interesting to me because I think more and more people are getting their PhDs for the sole purpose of elevating themselves in social media. And, you know, when I got my PhD, Nick, I, I didn't do a podcast for two years. The reason is because I didn't, I didn't feel like an expert. I needed to prove to myself that I could run a lab, that, that I could produce research um, without my mentor holding my hand and not that my, I mean, you work with a team, right? Mm -hmm. So you're kind of untested on your own. Do you have any original ideas? Right. So I was, I never wanted to open my mouth and, and probably after a few years of working with students and, and feeling like I had earned, because when you have a PhD, I think you have more impact. So there's, there's greater weight on what you say. So you have to be more cautious. But I, think I, the, I don't I don't I don't think you do. You do. I mean, yeah. I think that that's I think the 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 important thing is, is that the general population recognizes a Ph.D. equals expert. Yeah. 
I don't think the general population realizes that just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're an expert. I think that um, there is the, I mean, so many different avenues to get a PhD these days with all of these different, you know, you mentioned before mentorship, right? Like there's virtual PhDs, there's part-time, there's so many different versions. And I think that when you have someone such as yourself who takes their career very seriously and the and gives significant weight to what you're saying, I think that there's a lot of people that that are getting a PhD as easy as possible, not going through... I'm assuming the late nights in the lab, certainly the late nights writing manuscripts, like getting all of your thoughts together, collaboration, going to conference, all these other things. And yet they have this, this PhD behind their name. So now all of a sudden they're taken seriously. And there was a couple of PhDs where I, I, I'm like, what are you saying? Um, but again, that's the problem, you know, with social media, it's like clicks versus what's actually practical. And that's part of the reason why I have you on here because I want to dispel some of the bullshit that is there because at the end of the day, listen, I love blood flow restriction. I love strength training, but, and I love talking about the volume debate, right? And we'll briefly, hopefully talk about length and partials because I think that's another fascinating area um, of, of work that's being done. But we have a, we have an obesity overweight crisis people don't exercise in general so it's it's like are we really serving the society if we're scientists and we're supposed to be pr publishing research and we're supposed to be disseminating evidence-based information is it really serving society to create more barriers to exercise than there already exists without any of this nuance um, I tend to think we overcomplicate things because people need new content to post, right? So uh, I think a lot of it exists for that 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 very purpose. And um, I do think you know we we make training so hard to approach for a lot of people by overcomplicating it with with big words. And then you know on one hand we say, oh, not a whole lot matters, just get in the gym. And then on the other hand we say, if you're training this way, you're missing out on gains. Mm -hmm. We're not even consistent within um, what we communicate to people. I've, I've yep. noticed that it's like one thing one week and then a different message the next week. And it's like, what is it? You know, and when I, when my, in my classroom, I'm probably incredibly boring because my students ask, well, what about this versus this? I said, at the end of the day, they're probably pretty similar. Um, when you look at any advanced technique, it's just a different way to reach the same endpoint. Um, drop sets. Myo reps, long rest, short rest. A number of sets to failure is going to get you that same endpoint of fatigue and activating the musculature, which is going to make the muscle grow. So there's so many ways to get there. And it's it's it is interesting how you know there's different seasons where something's trending. So right now it's length and partials for whatever reason, right? Um, and when I first heard about that idea, one of my students brought up in class and I said, huh, that's interesting. What's the rationale? He's like, I don't know, Titan. I was like, really? Um, and, <laughs> and you know, it's it's just it's taken off from there. And maybe it's because we need something to talk about. But um, you know, for this particular technique, you know, we're now telling people because I've heard it on, I don't, I can't tell you how many podcasts I've heard it that you might be missing out on gains if you're doing full range of motion. Now, does the evidence support that conclusion? You know, the, the review paper that statement comes from had three papers that compared length and partials to full range of motion. Um, three papers that allegedly compared that. You look at the first one, um, it's by Goto. And, and Goto did, I believe, it was a tricep extension. And I think it was like five people. It was, I think it was a small sample size, but I wrote this down so I don't mess it up. The Goto paper, yeah. Um, eight week tricep program training three times a week. One group did full range of motion from zero degrees to 120. And the partials did 45 to 90 degrees, just the middle part of the range of motion. The middle part led to 49% increase in CSA over eight weeks time 
the full range of motion led to 28% increase in tricep CSA over eight weeks time. I made a comment on, on social media. I said, 49%, this doesn't happen. Like 49%. And um, I tried to engage with the person that was talking about this paper and they, they clearly weren't going to have a discussion because I, I just want to get to the bottom of like, how is 49% growth possible in eight weeks? You know, when you look at tricep CSA, I believe the average growth should be around six to 8%. So starting, start, the starting point for me is how, how did we get 49% increase? And, you know, part of me thinks it might be error because they estimated tricep CSA from a combination of arm circumference and muscle thickness. So I would like to honestly just see the muscle thickness data um, to see like maybe it would tell a more clear story if we didn't add in circumference. You know, we know from other studies that circumference can't always predict growth. For example, your muscle thickness could increase with no change in your arm circumference. Mm -hmm. um, how, is that, how is that possible? Um, because the change in muscle thickness is so small and maybe your precision to measure your arm circumference isn't as refined. So you're not going to capture that on a circumference measurement, but you can on an ultrasound measurement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, but 49% increase in tricep CSA, that's remarkable. The other problem with that study is it was the middle range of motion that was superior. That's not a length and partial, right? But this study is being used as evidence that a length and partial is superior to full range of motion. There's so like, I, I would say like when I talk about with my students, I say, we need to be careful with this paper because I'm not aware that 49% growth is, should be possible over eight weeks. Therefore, you know, we didn't have a control group, so we don't know the error of the measurement. And it seems like there's probably something going on here. Um, but even if we were going to use it for evidence, it was the middle range of motion, not the length and partial. Um, the second study in the paper, I think, was Pedrosa. Pedrosa, um, I wrote this down too, 45 untrained women doing bilateral knee extension. Full range of motion was 100 degrees to 30 degrees. Um, the long muscle length was 100 degrees to 65 degrees. 60% 60 of 1RM, both groups did three to six sets of seven repetitions. The long muscle lengths was better for the rectus femoris, but not the vastus lateralis. When I read this paper, um, I was talking to my student, Enrique. I said, Enrique, what do you think might be an issue with this paper? He said, well, they did the same number of reps. He's like, we made the same mistake in the BFR literature. We used to say BFR was superior to low load training because they weren't training to failure. They're doing matched repetitions. So when we read the Pedrosa paper, it leaves a possibility that long muscle lengths are better for one muscle group. But you have to acknowledge that they didn't train to failure. And it's very possible um, that long muscle lengths are more fatiguing. There's less overlap between your actin and myosin. So presumably I would think, or I, based on no good mechanism for long muscle lengths, I would assume that the long muscle lengths are probably closer to failure. And maybe that's why they had a little bit better growth. Um, the third paper in that meta-analysis um, was the Workhausen paper, which had like an explosive leg press protocol. Um, and neither group saw any growth. So that whole meta-analysis, and, and to be fair, I think the meta-analysis is written a lot tamer than what's been communicated on social media, right? When I read the paper, I'm like, oh, this it's not like telling us stop training full range of motion. It's simply saying there, there's a possibility, right? But what I've gotten from social media lately is stop training full range of motion and start prioritizing length and partials. Now, if it's based on these three papers, I would be hard pressed to make that recommendation. You know, and I, I think the, the, the person that's, that's pushing a lot of this is, is basing it on some of the isometric data, right? Some of the data that didn't directly compare these things, but it's the recommendation I'm taking issue with is full range of motion versus a lengthened partial. And I simply do not think we have enough evidence. There's been one study that came out from Watalo Cassiano, um, who's, who's at mm -hmm. Ole Miss now. Um, and it was in the calf musculature. 
And the lengthened partials or the, the beginning range of motion seem to be a little bit better for the calves. But I tend to think the calves is a different muscle group. The calves are very hard to fatigue. We did a calf training study in my lab with BFR, and we got no calf growth in the yeah. study at all. Um, so um, I talked to Watalo, and Watalo has done range of motion research, and he seems less compelled um, that long muscle lengths are anything special. Um, so I, I, I appreciate his insight, um, but there's just not when I look at the body of literature, there's not what's being communicated. And I don't understand why it's being communicated the way that it is. Um, I think we need to have a lot of caution and I think we mean, need to be open to other possibilities. You know, I, now I think about it cause I'm always writing papers in my head and um, you know, do, if you do a bicep curl, this is where I feel the muscle squeeze here. And you can try this. You, you don't mm -hmm. feel a whole lot. So I find it hard to believe. That was just a time for me to flex. Yeah. <laughs> now I now I regret flexing. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I we're also kind of being, what's, what's the word here? It's like A or B. It's better. It's not better. But, but there's other You're things. being binary yeah, we're, or we're dichotomous. Being, we're, we're being dichotomous with this. There might be things about full range of motion that we're just not measuring in these studies. So why tell people that full range of motion, you might be spending less time in the anabolic portion of the lift. And what is the anabolic portion of the lift? What does this mean? Um, well, this is where, this is where I kind of want to talk. So, you know, there is the, well, what have you encountered as explanatory mechanisms as to why a lengthened partial might be better than a full range of motion exercise. Yeah. I, I in the review paper um, that's been going around, I believe the proposed mechanisms are increased passive tension. And I think they uh, might mention, let me see if I, greater deoxygenation. I think these are the yeah. Those are the two that I've kind of um, that I've I've seen, but I guess it goes back to then zooming in a little bit more. And when we zoom in a little bit more, what I have seen in in my understanding is that there are a lot of assumptions that are being made. The main one is obviously what you just commented on, right? Us basically over assuming what the current body of evidence is, is saying. But even if you move past that and you say, okay, well, what tends to happen in a lengthened contraction, right? You tend to see distal hypertrophy of where you're, where you're going more so than proximal or, or middle. So it's preferentially stressed distally, fine. Okay. Well, that's fine and dandy. Um, but my next thing is, okay, go a little bit further. Well, what's happening at the muscle fiber level that could potentially increase the hypertrophic stimulus at a lengthened position? So then you need to think, okay, well, well then what will augment the potential stress at longer muscle lengths? Well, if it, if, if it truly is some passive tension, well, then how do you activate the pass or how do you get that passive tension? And for me, it's like, all right, well, then you go back to the length tension relationship. If a muscle doesn't have the sarcomeres reach the descending limb, then you're contracting and you're not getting any sort of passive tension at the range of motion because it's it's literally the Titan molecule is not able to further add to the tension that that muscle fiber is experiencing. So if you just play with that, and that's not even including the assumptions of sarcomerogenesis that happens for that as an explanatory mechanism, but then you say, right, at some point, at some point, we can't add more muscle fiber for a given area. Like we only, we go from an origin to an insertion, that's it. It's not like we go from origin to a secondary and we create new things. So then it's like, okay, if length and partials are beneficial, that's great. 
But at some point that benefit has to run out. I don't, I, I just, it, it, from what we, and that's just what, from what we know about sarcomerogenesis or increases in facile length and the training status of these individuals. So there's just so many assumptions that are going, you know, into this that it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's like, I mean, like you go back to the same thing we talked about earlier, which is just increasing complexity for the sake of increasing complexity. But then who is that serving? Mm -hmm. That's serving the social media post that you're going to get, the clicks you're going to get. And who is that not serving? The everyday Joe and Jane who are now hearing on the news or hearing in other other through other fitness people or whatever in their circle that you have to perform exercise a certain way with a certain rest period with a, all these other things that then get back to the point of we're creating a barrier. Are we creating a barrier? How is that helping society in general? And that's where my beef comes in with this whole length and partial shtick is so many oversights. And it's just like these definitive statements for, from some people where it's just like, like, even if that is so, yeah, who is that helping? Well, I, I think <clears throat> I have no problem if they want to say, I believe this is better based on my experience and my interpretation of this research. But what I don't like is we now know this based on this, this, and this, and these eight studies. And it's like, stop, we need to go over these eight studies. You're claiming support this, right? Um, in a very authoritative way it's it's like i i think people can believe that length and partials are better and, and maybe they have a reason to but i don't think we can pretend that we have sufficient evidence to make these recommendations and i suspect that the data isn't gonna turn out that way like i you know there's there's an ongoing study and i i just i don't see a strong rationale to suspect that the you know, the differences are going to be there based on my understanding of how muscle works. Um, and there's, you know, when I tried to bring up the, the Goto paper, which I think we can both agree, it's not evidence for length and partials. It's a middle range of motion. I said, you know, based on my experience measuring muscle, this number seems really high. And I was just told uh, you're appealing to authority. I, I was told it's appealing to authority. I was like, no, I'm sharing my experience because it, it's helping you. I, I'm trying to help you understand why I think this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't care to ever be called doctor. I never mention it. It, it, it. I'm. I'm wrong more than I'm right. And you know, I. My my mentor put me in my place in, enough times where I'm. I try to be cautious. I try to be gracious and, and kind to people. Um, you know, when I read the Pedrosa paper, I had a similar experience because the Pedrosa paper which um, is, is probably one of the more compelling papers. But like we said, they didn't train to failure. Um, at least we don't know how close to failure they trained. So we don't know how homogenous the, the stimulus was. But I, if you look at figure three in the Pedrosa paper, and I don't know, maybe tech, I can pop up figure three. It's just like, you look at that data and it looks like it's all over the place. Some groups are losing a little bit of muscle, but then the, the, um, the long muscle length is growing in some cases like 28%. Again, this is a lot of growth. So for when I see that, I often think maybe we have swelling. If you're doing something very new and very novel, I don't think you can take a study that did four sets of exercise and show that there's no swelling 48 hours after as evidence that this new protocol didn't cause people to swell or have inflammation in a way that's not present during other exercise protocols. Mm -hmm. So, you know... I think the current state of this evidence is, is very weak. I think it's potential that it pans out this way. Um, I don't suspect that length and partials are superior to training with full range of motion. Um, and I think we need more robust study designs with larger sample sizes. Um, and I think we need multiple labs examining this because I think if we have one research group, I, I don't think it's going to, um, you know, I, I just think you need diversity of mm -hmm. experience working on a, a research question. One other thing I'll add, and, and you kind of mentioned it, you know, you talked about distal growth or, or proximal growth. Um, this is another reason why we need control groups. And I'll explain. When I measure muscle thickness 
and I, I promise I'm not putting up my arm because I think it's big. <laughs> um, if I measure muscle thickness in the middle of my bicep, I have pretty good reliability. If I measure muscle thickness at the top of my bicep, I have tremendously, tremendously less reliability because there's a lot more connective tissue there and the image is not clear. Mm. So <clears throat> as you measure proximal and distal on these muscle sites, I believe it becomes more important to have a control group so you can interpret your data in the context wow. of your error of the measurement. And, you know, if your only differences are at these proximal and distal sites, uh, then I'm going to wonder, okay, was well, your error just greater at these sites because they're harder to mm -hmm. image? Because in my experience, they are harder to image. Um, so I think that's another thing. If we're not implementing control groups, um, we're going to be even more limited in our ability to interpret this data. Yeah. Um, now, it's going to, if the data comes out and shows what's been discussed, it's going to be overblown in the industry, in the evidence-based industry, because it's, it's already happened with no new data, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, science is a very slow moving and, and cautious process where different experts have different opinions. Um, you know, one thing, again, I was, I was discussing with somebody earlier. It's very interesting to me, um, and, and this is just something I've noticed over the last few years, there's no diversity of opinion in the evidence-based industry. And I think that's well illustrated by the fact that everyone made a post about three minutes of rest. You need to rest long for hypertrophy. You know, I have a different thought. And if I go to an academic conference, you're going to find a diversity of opinions on these topics. What exists on social media is whatever the most um, popular thought with the most following is the thought you get from every communicator. And I, I, I wonder if it's, you know, if let's agree with the person with the most follows, maybe we'll get a, a, a repost and our stuff will go viral and we'll, we'll grow. You'd be surprised. There's definitely people that think like that. Um, but I, I definitely think, I, I hope it changes in the future, but I don't see the same diversity of opinion in the communication of resistance exercise science um, on social media that actually exists within science. Mm -hmm. I think you get kind of one group um, that almost controls the ideas. And, and those are the, the, the people that communicate resistance exercise. Let's say they're in the nutrition space. Well, they just side with the person that's the most popular person because you're going to not get much pushback on that. So mm -hmm. what you actually end up with is very little diversity of thought in the resistance exercise space, in, in my opinion. That's what I've kind of witnessed over the past several years. No, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's important for me. So I've had people on this podcast that have very differing views. And I do that for my own curiosity, just so we can, I can create a more diverse hate to use the same word <laughs> you just use but more a diverse more fluid model in my head about how strength training works but unfortunately the the byproduct is that there's it's an echo chamber and besides that echo chamber you then start to to see because guess who are reading these posts or viewing these posts is it's usually the general population it's a very small percentage of overall practitioners and providers. And unfortunately, when you increase the complexity um, and you start to say, this is how you do it, like I'll give you my personal example. Like I was always of the thought that you have to train, you know, five, four to five times a week in order to maximize the benefits because more volume is going to be better and that allows you to grow more. And ultimately what ended up happening is I just kept on getting injured. I kept on getting like more overuse injuries and felt like crap and everything. And then you realize that it actually, yeah, there's a role of volume, whatever nebulous role that is, but it's ultimately individualized to how much you can recover from as a person, which goes back to principle-based versus protocol based. And you basically say, okay, well, I've actually settled upon doing a couple of full body workouts per week. 
at a what you would consider probably a lower volume like two two to three sets max per i mean you you see my my workouts on social and my story like i don't do much volume but i'm also tracking over time am i progressively overloading and i think that it gets back to the conversation that we had earlier whereas people just want to be told what to do and so the people that are 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 in the in the position of being social media influencers who may or may not have a phd are are engagement farming and creating an environment that is not open to intellectual discussion because at the end of the day you're then either appealing to authority or you're being an asshole and having comments like that that you're making on the youtube uh and just being ignored is basically typically you know what what the status quo is of social media um which is just super frustrating um and 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 just annoying um in an effort to wrap this up we talked about volume we talked about length and partials so if you're going to give somebody a recommendation in terms of um strength training based on your current understanding of of volume what is your recommendation for that person um in terms of their load in terms of how intense they're supposed to work out, in terms of the rest, right? Everything that you can give, you know, in a three to five minute spiel. Okay, that's that's a tough one. Um, I, I will say we typically talk about volume as X amount of weekly sets, you know, 20, 25, 42, 45, 52 weekly sets. <laughs> um, I tend to think about it a little bit differently. I think of it on a per exercise basis. On a per exercise basis, I see little value to going beyond three or four sets per exercise, right? That's why the 52 set paper never made sense to me. Why are we doing nine sets on one exercise? Um, the pizza's cooked, take it out of the oven. Um, so, you know, and I actually asked this on one of my final exams to my students because I don't know the answer. So three to four sets per exercise, um, then, okay, how many variations do we need? I mean, different exercises hit muscles and fatigue muscles differently. So it's reasonable to suspect, and I think James still actually has a paper on exercise variation. Um, how many variations of an exercise do we need to maximize growth in a muscle per training session? Maybe two to three exercises for a muscle group, you know, that hit the muscle in different ways. Um, and then you have to say, well, okay, what frequency? And it probably depends on your recovery and everything else you have going on in your life. Um, two to three times per week, two to three sets, um, or three to four sets per exercise, um, two to three exercises. So I, I've never done that math for how many weekly sets that is, but it's it's probably what some literature would consider a moderate volume. Maybe some literature would consider it a high volume. So not anti-high volume, Right. Um, I just think some of the volume literature probably is measuring swelling instead of growth because the growth to me looks too high. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't think you need five working sets per exercise and I don't think you need 45 weekly sets. I think you can stop three or four sets per exercise, do three or four, um, exercises per training session, two to three times a week. Does, does that recommendation make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I I think that we just need to simplify all the clutter. And I yeah. think you did a good job. You did a good job of that. What about rest periods and intensity? And by intensity, I'm referring to load. Does load matter? Where, how, how, you know, how hard are you working during these sets? What is your, your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, I think we need three or four sets to or near failure. You know, I think people get caught up on failure so often and you'll see so much content made on, do you need to train to failure? Um, you just need to be too or near or close to it. Um, you need sufficient activation and fatigue. And we know we can accomplish that with, you know, you mentioned it 15% in one study, but 15%, you're probably borderline too low of a, of a training load. Um, so 20 to 30%, all the way up to 70, 75%. There's some studies that get away with 80, but I don't think 80 works on every exercise. It depends on the exercise you're doing. 
But as long as you re remain um, eight to 12 reps, but I think, I think eight, sometimes when, when we do research and people are only getting eight reps to, for, for each set, I have less confidence that I'm going to get, you know, a, a non-heterogeneous growth response, meaning I, I have more confidence if they're closer to 12 than eight. And, and I, I don't think that's a wide held opinion. I think that's probably just a me opinion. And the mm -hmm. like in, the, in research, you want to maximize the possibility that your participants are going to grow. So you want to, you want to grow stimulus. So if, if they're like borderline to squeezing out that eighth threat, sometimes I have a little bit less confidence in the hypertrophic potential. Um, so yeah, I think loads as low as 20, 30%, all the way up to 70, 75%, three or four sets per exercise, two or near failure. If you're going to grow, I think that'll do it. Um, Regardless of the rest period you take, what, what are oh, you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So rest, how, where rest plays into that, you know, if you take shorter rests, it might be necessary to decrease the weight on the bar. And so this is how I view it. If you take one minute rest and you only get five reps on set two, well, then you need more rest or you need less weight. Now, people that advocate for volume being the primary driver are going to say, well, if you decrease the weight to remain in a hypertrophic range, you sacrifice gains. I don't think that's true. Um, and I, I think there's multiple lines of evidence that would support that. One of them being blood flow restriction, one of them being lower loads to failure. So... <laughs> If high load training works and low load training works, then why not decreasing the load and why would decreasing the load and remaining in a hypertrophic rep range no longer mm -hmm. facilitate growth? Um, and that's where I think I've seen conflicting ideology or conflicting um, narratives in, in the communication of science space. When a focus of a study is volume, typically I feel like the bias is towards the group that does higher volume. But when you do nearly the same manipulation, but it's now perceived as an advanced technique, like drop sets, like Maya reps, all of a sudden it's good for growth, <laughs> right? So it's, it's just, it's funny to me that if, if a focus of intervention is volume, then the group that gets less volume is not going to be ideal. But if, if we, if we pitch it differently, we don't pitch it as a volume reducer, but we pitch it as an advanced training technique. I feel like our bias is, well, now it's going to, now it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, ha I had some discussion um, with Paul. He, he, he pushed back a little bit on a post I made and we had some good discussion. Um, he said, we just need to make up for it with additional sets. And he said, some of those drop set papers are just comparing to lower volumes in general, which, which might be true. But in general, I think drop sets and, and these sorts of things that manipulate rest are just ways to reach the same endpoint. Mm -hmm. I view muscle growth as you're starting here, you have to get to here, which is fatiguing and activating the majority of the fibers in the movement. And you can get there with drop sets, you can get there with myos reps, you can get there with and insert your advanced technique, low loads, high loads, short rest periods, long rest periods. As long as you get to that point of activating and fatiguing the majority of the muscle involved in the movement, I think your growth is gonna be remarkably similar. Just label everything in advanced technique and then it's all good. I think so. <laughs> yeah. We well, just have to have good marketing. And uh, sometimes when, um, I mean, Holly, you're training in the gym, I come up with new stupid names for something we're doing. I said, let's just call it this and publish a paper. And, and I'm of course joking. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's just sometimes how things work when you perceive yeah. it as advanced, all of a sudden it's the new cool thing. So, so where, where can people find you? Any last parting words for the audience as we uh, we finish this little podcast? Um, uh, I'm at Samuel Buckner on Instagram. I, I, I'm not really active on Twitter and I don't think Facebook's still a thing. So um, at Samuel Oh, Buckner, it is. As it long is. as you're like, you know, above 55, 60. Yeah, it's I'll hot. One day. My parents, they get like 88 comments on like a family picture and um, you know, it's crazy actually. I, yeah, I think sometimes, uh, you know, I have a phone call with my mom and she's like, you never responded to that thing I sent you. And I'm like, did you send it on Facebook, mom? And uh, <laughs> you, know, I, I, you have to remember to go check it. Um, but yeah, at Samuel Buckner on Instagram, 
Um, that's probably the best place to, to follow me. I, I need to start posting more. Um, most of what I put up is our new papers and an occasional thought on a paper, these sorts of things. Um, but I'm going to try to be a bit more active. You know, one thing I've learned is that sometimes if you don't speak up, no one's going to. You know, I, I, I used to think just, ah, I need to be patient and publish a paper on it. Um, but I've learned even publishing a paper on it, if, if you're not on the side that's popular to be talked about, it won't be talked about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I, I'm probably becoming more pessimistic, but I'm a genuinely happy person. And I, uh, I really enjoy what I do. I, I think it's so fun to study muscle growth and, and talk about these things. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm driven by just a passion to learn more about this stuff and uh, be humbled along the way, every, every step of the way. So um, yeah, I, I, I hope people, if they do follow me, they, they find that content valuable. Yeah, definitely uh, follow Dr. Buckner. He's uh, he's definitely refreshing in, in terms of the skepticism. And I think that that's really important to have uh, because at the end of the day, um, we just need to keep moving and muscle growth is fascinating um, from the aesthetic perspective, but also the metabolic perspective um, and addressing a lot of the health crises that we're having, at least in the United States and, and really worldwide. Um, and that's why I'm interested in, in muscle growth. So I really appreciate all the thoughts that you shared today. Reach out to him at, uh, on Instagram, Samuel Buckner. And uh, until next time, that's the episode. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.